let's look at the tissue response to stress. We've learned what the absence of stress will do, but how should we be applying the stress? Peacock and Cohen in 1990 looked at a healing wound in a rat. They had subcutaneous sponges that were attached to the tissues in which there was a magnet and they then applied an electromagnetic field that provided mechanical force to elongate this healing collagen. It was this study that proved that early intervention to healing tissue can direct how tissue changes. The formation of new collagen fibers, as we know, can be determined by the mechanical stimuli of motion, which affects the new collagen fiber formation alignment as well as the amount of cross-linking. The arrangement, the number, and the thickness of the fibers is determined by the stimuli. We know that early motion is preferable because of these positive effects. Gower and colleagues in 87 looked at wounds in rabbits and they stressed the wounds by applying CPM to the extremity and moving the joints. They compared this to extremities with wounds that were immobilized and the wounds stressed by the CPM were significantly stronger, stiffer, and tougher when stress was applied. This proved that the structural organization of collagen fibers is superior when early but gentle stress is applied. Gelberman and others have shown us that a small amount of input will change the cellularity as the tissue heals. At six weeks, there was a significant increase in cellularity just from five minutes of range of motion a day. In other words, healing tissues are extremely sensitive to stress and motion, and therefore we as hand therapists are very effective with the early stiff hand to direct these tissues in the right direction. But how does this person gain such a large hole in the ear. It starts with a small puncture and slowly larger and larger rings are inserted to provide constant force, not intermittent but constant, which demands that the tissue literally grow to accommodate the size of the ring. If we want chronic stiffness, which represents cross-linked collagen, to change, our influence has to be more constant and less intermittent. Our efforts of motion will modulate the protoglycan synthesis. The lubrication of the cells will be improved based on applying motion to pump. Movement maintains that lubrication within the collagen cell matrix, which is necessary for movement to occur. It prevents the cross-linking that's abnormal, and it orients the new collagen fibers to resist stress. Now, the term low load prolonged stress has been accepted and adopted within the therapy community but we have been unable to create any formula for either the amount or duration of stress. And I would offer you that what we often describe as low load prolonged stress truly does not have the element of prolonged. Therefore, we have not quite solved this problem. Glasgow in 2012 determined that the treatment duration determined the contractor resolution with the use of a dynamic orthosis and that the duration of treatment was key to the contractor resolution. We all know that this is the case. The stiffer the joint, 
the greater the duration to affect change. She also noted that flexion gains were faster than extension. Uh, for me, that is logical since flexion is more powerful. We need to be clear about the difference between the visco elastic response and the plastic response. Human tissues are viscoelastic rather than elastic, but nevertheless, the response is that we stretch, if you will, or elongate the collagen, but it returns to its original length and shape. This is a temporary response that has no long-term change. What we want in human tissue is the plastic response so that we actually change, the mechanical term is deformed, we actually deform the collagen by the application of stress that is applied for a long enough period of time. So how do we do this? The reality of viscoelastic behavior is what dooms stretching techniques. In other words, for example, joint mobilization to a very limited application in managing joint stiffness. Because of this return to original length, a short stretch does not effect change. A short stretch allows the tissue to return. This explains why you can apply heat and you can passively mobilize interphalangeal joints in the clinic, for example, and yet when the patient returns, the improvement seen at the end of the initial session is not maintained. So let's talk specifically about passive range of motion. Most therapists I know believe that stiff joints first must be passively mobilized so that we can create the potential for active motion. I would like to convince you otherwise. We know already that the human response is viscoelastic rather than elastic, and that with a constant load, deformation or elongation will occur over time, which is called creep. And then the tissue will actually respond. It will relax in response to the stress if we hold it there. The tissue now will elongate, or as Dr. Paul Brand would say, it grows, and the resistance to the motion or the stress or elongation decreases. But let's think about this comment. While it is broadly accepted that contracted tissues will elongate with stress, the body of literature is inconsistent with respect to the definitions of creep and stress relaxation as they pertain to living tissues. Creep and stress relaxation are mechanical engineering terms. And those terms describe the response of objects that we know in the human world. They do not describe response of living tissue. In thinking about passive range of motion, we all consider it the gold standard in monitoring joint stiffness. If you look at articles and you look at the reporting, often they report the passive range of motion and the active range of motion measurements may be absent. I find this rather ironic because our end goal is that the patient has the ability to move actively and maintain the motion themselves and to have the motion functionally. Flowers and Listeo in 94 endeavored to identify this need for prolonged time. And they created a term called total end range time, determining that there is a positive relationship between how long you hold a stiff joint at its end range and the amount of improvement in passive range of motion. They indeed provided us with passive measurements. But the problem is we don't have the proven correlation between increases in passive and active motion. 
And we know clinically that active range of motion often lags behind passive range of motion. From my view, knowing that those casted six days have a greater range of passive motion than those casted three days is just not quite enough information. I want to know what was the difference in the active motion in response to the passive motion applied. Glasgow in 2011 identified that total in-range time has not found to be associated with contracture resolution. So we're still looking for the answer of how long should we hold a joint at end range. There was a very interesting study in 1971, which was a time when all joint injuries were immobilized for much longer periods of time. Three weeks of immobilization was standard care for a dislocated elbow. So this patient with a dislocated elbow underwent three weeks of immobilization, after which the range of motion was extremely limited. This physician endeavored to inject Novocaine, which would numb the elbow, in order to allow the patient to gain better motion. And indeed, after the injection, the range of motion was normal. But as this was repeated at weekly intervals, the response or improvement became progressively less and actually the elbow became stiffer. In other words, with an anesthesia injected into the elbow joint, active range of motion really became like passive range of motion. There were no monitors, there, were no, there was no feedback loop to tell this individual oh, that's stretching too much. And the motion became like an injury and the elbow became stiffer. Flowers, as the editor of the Journal of Hand Therapy, commented in 2010 that John Minnell had said that joint mobilization was never really intended as a treatment for joint stiffness. Contradicting some of our long-held beliefs that if we apply passive techniques, we can increase active joint mobility. Wiseman, in a study in 1980 with colleagues, cycled ligaments through range of motion. And as we know, this can be considered a warm up. And the response, as expected, would be that the amount of load required to move the ligament a given distance decreased after the cycling. We know that repeated motion increases the pliability of human tissues. In the end of 2013, Dr. Roy Meals, in his blog, uh, re in response to therapists, was asked the question, do you have a good explanation for patients as to why their fingers loosen up with heat stretch and then within two to three hours go back to being stiff again? And Dr. Mills replied, it's likely a relocation of extracellular fluid in the ligaments and joint capsules. When we do stretching exercises, we actually don't stretch the ligaments, but we just make them more supple with less extracellular fluid. When they're left alone for a while, fluid tends to reaccumulate, especially in areas recently inflamed. Patients with trigger fingers frequently comment that the triggering is worse in the morning and subsides as the day progresses. Cartilage requires a slow cyclical compression, decompression, or if you will, cyclical motion to facilitate the absorption of nutrients and to expel waste. Passive range of motion does not apply this cyclical motion to facilitate the healing of cartilage. For that reason, CPM is recommended for any injury of the joint. Anything that has to do with a joint reconstruction, the appropriate application of continuous passive motion may be prescribed. 
but continuous passive motion has not demonstrated any effectiveness whatsoever for treating joint stiffness that already exists. Gower and colleagues in 87 looked at a fracture in the ankle of a rabbit and looked at the application of daily passive range of motion with the CPM and the contralateral ankle, which had also been fractured, was immobilized. And they measured the stiffness of the ankle on a weekly basis. The results were that, as one would have expected, the ankle stiffness was significantly reduced immediately after passive motion. This is just the same as if the patient is in your clinic and you apply heat in passive motion. The patient looks better. But the exercise limbs, the ones that underwent CPM, between the sessions were significantly stiffer than the immobilized limbs. I'd like to repeat that. The limbs that underwent CPM between sessions actually were stiffer than those that had not been moved at all, suggesting that the CPM is a negative influence on regaining passive motion. So over the three week study period, the limbs that underwent passive motion became increasingly stiffer than the unexercised limbs. Additionally, it was noted that those limbs that underwent the intermittent CPM increased in the amount of edema. Meals used the same model as Gower but in 93, he looked at the ankle stiffness and the limb volume with four variables, drugs, an injection of an intraarticular hematoma, pressurization, and continuous passive motion. We're only looking at the continuous passive motion. He grouped the rabbits into five groups and they underwent three weeks of CPM at varying amounts of CPM per day from four hours to 24 hours. And his results were very interesting, that the limb swelling was approximately equal in all groups, but the joint stiffness was increased in those who underwent four or eight hours of CPM. It was about the same as the immobilized group, if they underwent 12 hours, but joint stiffness was reduced when there was a 16 or 24 hour period of gentle passive range of motion. In other words, there seemed to be a critical break off point where application of passive range of motion for shorter periods of time had a negative influence. So if we look at these studies, this suggests that there is indeed a documented negative response to passive range of motion. The problem is we don't have a good model of chronic stiffness to illustrate this, I think, even more dramatically. So I would say to you, if you want to think of mobilizing my stiff hand, Keep your hands off of my stiff hand. Let's focus on active mobilization and not passive. Let's avoid the negative effects of passive motion, which look great in the clinic, but have no long-term positive effect. Even applying a mobilization orthosis is not creating movement. There's certainly no active component. There's no cortical involvement, and there is some constriction. I want to be very clear and make sure that we have created a clear distinction between the early stiffness that you see when edema is the primary limiting factor. Gentle passive range of motion 
is, in my opinion, very appropriate and very helpful early on. Just urging the tissues to change. If you recall the vicious circle we drew about early stiffness, changing any one factor will change the other two factors. So gentle passive range of motion will allow the patient to have slightly more active motion, will pump more and reduce the edema, and that will change and reduce the vicious cycle. But it is the stiff hand, the chronic hand, where passive range of motion is much less effective. Even though these joints are stiffer and you feel like you have to push harder, there is no proof that that is effective and there is a suggestion that it is actually a negative influence. What is required, however, is a prolonged, more prolonged, repeated stress. Again, a low level of stress, not excessive and not passive. We want to change the tissue, but we also want to change the cortical representation so that it changes the pattern of motion. That's what creates permanent change instead of temporary. 